Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a program called Hive. Uh, this is a program to build a next generation ASIC for the processing of graph data. And the goal of this program is to build a processor and a software stack associated with that processor that's a thousand times more efficient than graph processing on traditional GPUs. Now, before I get into the details of this program and before I hand the bulk of this talk to uh, my collaborator, Peter Wang, what I really want to do is to give you a sense of why this is an important problem. It turns out that every time you buy something on Amazon, every time you connect with somebody through a social network, all of those data are represented as graphs. And the algorithms that process those data are called graph algorithms. And typically, they have characteristics that are highly pathological for the kinds of processors that we build today. Um, and their pathologies can be diagnosed in a couple of different ways. And I think it's important for us to first figure out what the, what the pathologies are before we tell you about what our solutions look like. Now, the first pathology is this. These algorithms have the tendency to want to access memory randomly. And what that results in is typically this problem that every time we want to do some kind of computation, uh, we're stuck waiting for memory uh, to return to us before we can actually do that computation. And the reason for that is that memory is really, really slow to access, and c computation of mathematical instructions is really, really fast in, in standard processors. And so what we have is this pathology where we try to execute an instruction. We need data to execute that instruction. We go fetch it from memory, and then we stall and wait. And as a result, we can't keep processors busy. In fact, GPUs give us thousands and thousands of cores. And when we try to process graph algorithms on CPUs, oftentimes we can't make use of most of those cores because we're waiting on memory to return. Now, one of the tricks that architects use in order to hide the latency of memory is this scheme called caching, which I'm sure many of you know about. Uh, and caching depends on this principle that when you access memory, you will access the same location of memory again sometime soon. The problem with graph algorithms is that this almost never occurs, or at least it doesn't occur at the same rate that we generally would like to have. Um, so dense workloads, dense mathematical workloads like DNNs and so on, have this property that they often will have cache hit rates that are well in the 90, 95% range. When we run graph workloads on top of standard processors with standard caches, we get hit rates that are often less than 50%. And what that means is that one out of every two memory accesses, we actually have to pay the full cost of a memory access. And sometimes those memory accesses can cost hundreds of cycles, meaning that there were hundreds of mathematical instructions we could have done, but instead we were sitting around waiting for the, for the memory to return. And there's nothing we can do about it to make faster memories and caches that, uh, that uh, allow us to, to hide the latency of external memory requests. Now, the other scheme that modern processors give us is an ability to parallelize. GPUs, multi-core systems give us lots and lots of cores, but the problem with graphs is that it's really hard to divide our data up into chunks that we can actually process independently on different cores. And so we have this problem of bad scaling when we parallelize. So many machine learning algorithms are embarrassingly parallel. They're very easy to separate out uh, into chunks and execute in different processing elements. Unfortunately, graph algorithms have scaling properties that are very poor, very nonlinear, very sublinear. And as a result, you can throw more processors at the problem, but not actually get very much return in terms of, uh, of parallel execution performance. So the problem there has to do with the fact that uh, the, the, the data that we need is often sitting on a different processor, and we need to have communication between processors that bottlenecks the entire system in terms of how well we can parallelize. So, what we've been building in the Hive program is a kind of architecture that tries to address each of these issues. 
First amongst these is fundamentally change the latencies associated with memory accesses by making memory accesses that are small efficient and making the latencies for accessing those memories much lower than traditional processors. On top of that, we've built systems that can communicate really well across processing elements and across memory. And the net result of this architecture, which you'll hear more about in the subsequent talk, is that we've been able to accelerate graph workloads, at least in simulation and emulation, at rates of over 100x uh, with a combination of both better memory design and better communications design, coupled with parallel computation that is able to exploit all of this memory bandwidth and, uh, and, and communications bandwidth. Now, it turns out that, uh, that you can't just build hardware. Uh, as Steve told you, a lot of the problem is actually software. A lot of the opportunity that's available for us in terms of making use of these kinds of hardware facilities fundamentally requires us to rethink the hardware that we're building, uh, sorry, the software that we're building. And so we are uh, engaged in an effort in the second phase of our program to build software that communicates with a larger data ecosystem that allows graphs to be processed in various forms, including with tabular data and through the entire data science stack. And with that, I'm going to stop and, and let uh, the, uh, the subsequent speaker tell you more about uh, the work that we're doing in this area because they are fundamentally responsible for the software frameworks that we're building. Lastly, I'll just finish by saying that um, we have a number of teams that are working on this effort. I can't tell you about all the efforts that are going on, but uh, you can reach out to the different people that are working here, both on the hardware and software side of things. Um, and the next speaker, Mr. Peter Wang, will tell you about both the hardware details of, of the system that's being built and the software stack that's being built in phase two. Thank you. All right, hi everyone, I'm Peter Wang. I'm CTO and co-founder of Anaconda. And um, I'm going to start by talking about, you know, why we have to have a complete solution, hardware and software. Actually, I'm not, because you all know why, right? We need to have hardware that's faster, that's better, completely different design, and we need software to enable that. But both of these are challenges in their own right. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hardware and then spend much more time on the software that we're, uh, that we're putting together to make this possible. So the hardware itself that, um, that, that's been worked on in the first phase of this program um, it, it, it addresses fundamentally the core challenges for graph computing, as Wade talked about. Um, you can think about it kind of breaking down a couple of different or three different uh, regions. I think of the first two, the control and data flow and the memory hierarchy issues, as being the wound and the band-aid, right? And both are not sufficient to meet the challenges of graph computing. Fundamentally, you have a pointer chasing problem. You have to follow data wherever it might be in memory, and the memory space is large. And most modern software stacks, most modern hardware is simply not performant for that particular task. The Band-Aid we've put on top of that, the caching and the layers and layers of caching that Wade talked about, that's been about 30 some odd years of, of Band-Aids uh, now kind of over this festering wound. Sorry for the gross metaphor so early in the morning, but it really is, um, it is completely unable to address the challenges that graph problems present to us. And most importantly, uh, if that weren't bad enough, the problem is that that same general problem uh, then spans to the network, right, which is even slower and even further away, and um, that becomes you know, what we call a scalability challenge. You have one slow computer, maybe by a thousand of them, it becomes kind of a fast computer, and that's simply not the case when it comes to graph problems. So to solve this, what Intel's put together is a, uh, an architecture called Puma, and um, it is reimagined from the chip level all the way up or across, however you might want to think about it. Um, and it starts with, at the fundamental level, it's a chip that's designed for small, irregular memory accesses across a globally unified memory space. So the chip does not assume it has all the memory nearby. It does not assume that all its problems will come from memory or all the data to feed its algorithms will come from um, uh, addresses next to each other. So if you just blow apart those two basic assumptions, you build an entirely different hardware architecture around small accesses to globally unified data. And then at every stage, every time there is a wire or interconnect or anything connecting one compute unit to one, some other data unit or another compute unit, every single point, if you optimize for latency and if you optimize for bandwidth and throughput at the same time, 
then you can build and conceive an entirely different architecture. So at the chip level, it's redesigned, it's fully integrated at the server or chassis model, and it's designed again to scale up, um, to uh, or scale out across clusters, across many different uh, racks. So this memory, uh, this new architecture is very, very exciting. Um, we're very excited to work on it, but it's also, um, uh, it's also very, very performant based on the, the uh, benchmarks and um, the simulator results and many other uh, work that's been done in the, in the phase one of the program. Um, the scaling efficiency is actually, uh, the hardware speed up is nice, you know, a few hundred X, that's, you know, I'll take that on, a, on, a, on a, a random morning, but the node scaling is really the critical problem. So we talked about trillions of edges, we know that number's gonna get bigger. Um, the way I like to put this is it's great to have a fast tank. It's great if you can field more than one of them into the, uh, into the battle theater, right? So what this allows us to do is actually paralyze our approach to graph problems. But of course, all that hardware needs software to drive it, right? And so right now, the challenges um, for software, our goals are to actually address some of the core challenges that, that face the graph analytics space. So um, one of them, one of the things that's maybe just obvious is we want the software to get used. And, and that's harder than, than it might sound for a room full of probably mostly hardware people. There's tons of software out there, right? There's a lot of graph analytics libraries. And, um, and they, they all sort of suffer from the core weaknesses that I'll talk about later, but one of the goals for Hive, perhaps the most fundamental goal for the Hive software team, is to build a software framework that integrates them. Um, this is your classic, you know, there's 14 standards and, and none of them are great, so let's build a 15th one. It's not even that these different libraries that are out there don't pretend to be standards. They solve particular research problems. They're designed for specific kinds of workloads on graphs. We're actually trying to build an integration effort. And you can really think of the core thing here is de-siloing. We want to eliminate silos. Um, and so uh, based on our experience in servicing the Python data science community and the larger data science community, um, we, we believe we have some approaches that can, that can address this. So uh, the, core ch the core challenge for a lot of the graph analytics software is that they have to balance three different things. It's like you need to build a three-legged stool, but you only have enough wood for about one leg. So what do you do? Well, you can't make a stool that's a third of the height because then you can't reach what you're trying to get to. So um, any kind of software library you build, you've got some algorithm and some APIs for the data scientists down the, you know, on the other side of, of your library, you have some algorithm that you want to encapsulate in that, um, in that user API. You also have some representation of data, the way you like it laid out so your algorithm can actually work effectively. And of course, you've got some, what we'll call a hardware backend. Um, your algorithm on top of that data structure is probably specialized for a particular kind of hardware. Maybe you've optimized it for CPUs, maybe you've optimized for GPUs or even you know, ASICs and FPGAs. But whatever it is, if you're a current uh, data science graph analytics library, you've made trade-offs, you've made significant trade-offs because you've specialized for a subset of research problems, you've specialized one kind of graph representation that, that you're good at with those algorithms, and then you're probably only targeting one hardware architecture because nobody's got time to target all of them. Um, and by specializing, the other little, the little broken connection that's shown here is if you specialize for graph representation, then you're disconnected from the data science ecosystem because you've cut off some libraries from being able to talk to you very fluently. So the way we're gonna solve this really with Hive, uh, the, the Hive software effort on TA2, is we are, um, in phase two rather, we are taking a modular approach and a plug-in architecture um, and we're gonna let basically all of the existing libraries do what they're good at, but we're gonna factor them into their constituent parts, whether it's a user API, maybe it's got a back end over here, and we have a dispatch engine and a workflow scheduler that is able to route work and tasks between these. On the back end, the hardware, uh, the hardware back ends, they need data in different representations, and so we have a set of transformers that will move the data uh, between different kinds of formats if necessary, and, and hopefully it's not too necessary. Um, so one example of hardware backend, this is from our collaborators at PNNL. Um, this is uh, a C++ backend for doing uh, parallel graph algorithms on CPUs. And this is one of the CPU backends that is available for all these different user front ends to, to talk to. Um, and the, the nice thing about this kind of plug-in architecture is that um, if you want to add a new piece of hardware, you need to build the data transformers uh, and the data models, if you have a new data model, um, that, that can talk to each other, and then the hardware backend, the compute backend itself, uh, needs to be there. But once you've built that and that plugs into the Hive infrastructure, the front-end APIs, they can just take advantage of that backend. 
Um, likewise, if you want to add a new user API, you don't have to rebuild the world. You just need to contribute the top half of your leg of that stool, so the, the, the new algorithm, the new APIs that you want, um, and then the implementation on one of the hardware backends. Once you put all this together, then the different, uh, the Hive infrastructure plugs and plays and routes work. So um, essentially, it's a graph problem to solve graph problems. I think of it as a meta graph. Your data transformation graphs, that's one set of graphs, and then the workflow engine itself is another graph. Um, and this is actually something we've done in the past. So the data transformation graph stuff is something that uh, we've worked on um, for just the dense uh, array uh, data science ecosystem. And the workflow graph side is something that we built uh, as part of a previous DARPA effort. Um, and that's a, whoops, where is it here? That's a library called Dask, which is a rising star right now in the data science ecosystem uh, for distributed scale up and scale out uh, computing for generally dense problems, but it's quite flexible. Uh, in fact, our industry partners at uh, NVIDIA, Dask is the heart of their RAPIDS kind of GPU-enabled data science framework. So by expressing these graph, these Hive graph workloads on the basis of the Dask scheduler, we're actually able to plug in and permute essentially subtasks with a much larger ecosystem of dense uh, array libraries. And that gives us some really interesting high-level optimization possibilities. We can switch backends um, for tasks, and then when we switch backends, that also gives the ability, uh, it, gives, it gives the rise, sorry, it gives rise to the opportunity to do high-level operator fusion on backends. So it's a really nice way for us to not, again, be in the silo for graph computing. We can now bring graph analytics, not only, not only can we bring all the libraries together, but we can actually bring graph analytics onto the same playing field as a lot of the standard dense array and tensor and data frame kinds of workloads. So you can really think of Hive as being this intermediary, this connective tissue between different frameworks, um, between different libraries, between different kinds of users, um, different constituencies, right? The hardware vendors, they're really good at backends and some runtimes. They're maybe not as good at reasoning about what is a performant and idiomatic and nice and expressive API for data scientists. Um, and so this is a really, uh, really interesting effort for us because we care a lot about the overall holistic growth of the ecosystem. Uh, we don't want to see graph libraries out kind of uh, in their own uh, little niche. So we're very excited to tackle this. And of course, like any ambitious project, there are some, some challenges. Uh, the first challenge is that uh, we may fail our data science users. We may still end up building something that's really, really kind of graphy and, uh, and doesn't uh, actually permute well with other things. Uh, or we are trying to be too general and that doesn't work well for any of the actual graph use cases. Now we're gonna work pretty hard from day one to have this being done in the open source. We're gonna work hard with lots of existing graph research groups to make sure that what we're building makes sense. Um, and then of course, we might build something that is nice for data scientists, but then doesn't run very fast, doesn't actually exploit all the advantages of this wonderful Puma hardware. Um, and so what we're, you know, we're really co-developing this with Intel um, from the get-go. So that's, these are sort of our basic mitigations for that. Um, and our timeline for, for the project, it's a fairly, I would say, aggressive timeline for the, the size and scope of the problem that we're tackling. Um, but you know, starting, starting next year, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see some of the API um, and interop uh, sort of our, our vision for those things manifesting as code uh, in the open source. We'll have early user testing to make sure that data scientists, again, from the beginning, uh, have something in their hands that they'd like to use. And one thing that I didn't, I guess, uh, underscore here, but I want to really reiterate, um, the software part of, the, the, of this project, of the high project, is not specific to Puma. It is a desilization effort, right? So it's to connect all these different graph libraries and data representations with all the different classes of hardware. So from the very beginning, uh, even though the Puma hardware is not available, we will be building this to run on CPUs and GPUs and other accelerators, and we want to have this be a very open, I mean, if we want to be connective tissue, we want everyone to be able to, to play in this space, right? So we want lots of hardware backends, all the new great hardware I've been seeing all of you talk about, we want those showing up and surfacing as capabilities inside this framework as well. Um, but the, the goal here is to create a nice middle ground, um, back to, this slide, wait, this slide here. Um, we want to be a nice middle ground for all these different constituencies. So, um, you know, keep an eye out. We do all of our work in open source at Anaconda, and so we love for, uh, for contributions from the community and input from uh, many of the designers and, um, uh, and developers here. And I, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>